Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for coming to uh, UEA this evening, and welcome to the 2024 British Academy Lecture Series that is being delivered in partnership um, with us here at UEA. Um, I'd like to thank you, the audience in our room, but also uh, to our uh, YouTube audience. Um, and um, please do let us know where you are joining us from in the chat. So I'm Professor Anshuman Mondal. I'm the Associate Dean of Research here at UEA um, for the Faculty of Arts and Humanities. Um, and I'm delighted that the British Academy is here um, and enabling us to listen to uh, Erica McAlpine's wonderful lecture. Um, the British Academy is the UK's National Academy for the Humanities and Social Sciences, and it mobilizes these disciplines to understand the world and to shape a brighter future. The Academy is uh, an independent fellowship of world-leading scholars, a funding body for research and a forum for debate. Uh, as such, its lecture program, curated by the fellowship, aims to stimulate discussion and debate. The British Academy lecture series reflects the wonderfully broad breadth of the subjects and academic perspectives within them. And today's lecture is delivered by a fellow of the British Academy, Dr. Erica McAlpine. Dr. McAlpine is an associate professor of English at the University of Oxford and the A.C. Cooper Fellow in English at St. Edmund Hall. Her most recent book, The Poet's Mistake, which was published by Princeton in University Press in 2020, catalogues the various mistakes that poets have made in poems over the past several centuries, as well as the complicated ways that literary critics have responded to such mistakes over time. It was a Times Literary Supplement Book of the Year and won the British Academy's Rose Mary Crochet Prize. She is also a poet and has published a collection of poems, The Country Gambler, and a poet um, which was published by Shearsman in uh, 2016. And her poems regularly appear in magazines including The Atlantic, The New York Review of Books, New uh, Statesman, The American Scholar, and The Times Literary Supplement. So I'll hand over to you, Erica, and look forward to hearing your lecture. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Anshu, and thank you to the British Academy and to UEA for inviting me to give this lecture today. Now, my topic is a vexed one among literary scholars, judgment. And my intention is to readmit evaluative criticism into my own reading practices, that is to be willing to declare poems not just interesting, but better or worse than other poems, more successful or less successful, good or even bad. This used to be common practice, but over the last hundred or so years, readers of poetry have tended to resist the notion that poems can be satisfactorily judged against one another or held to any specifically defined standards. How would such standards ever be determined, the discipline has asked, and by whom? What ethical, political, or philosophical values would necessarily factor into these aesthetic criteria. Now, I'm not going to be offering a theory of aesthetic judgment today, just an experiment in practicing it. And I'll do so by staging a contest between two poems, one verse versus the other, with me as the judge. Now, your first question is probably, well, who am I to say? Who is she to say? But I say, who am I not to? I think that when we avoid assigning value to the qualities that we admire or don't admire in poems, we risk disabling our strongest skills as close readers. And I hope this will come clear during today's experiment as I pit Matthew Arnold's Dover Beach, a poem that some of you will know, against a parody of it that some of you might not. And by the end of this lecture, I will have declared which one I believe is better, but I really hope that you will have decided too, because subjective opinions are important and fun. 
So for today's contest, parody complicates the argument. Parody is by definition an imitative art. As Oscar Wilde once said, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. But this may not be true for poetry, because the sincerest form, the sincerest form of parody is often very unflattering. And yet parody is not the same thing as poking fun, nor is it always sincere. Parody lies at one end of a long spectrum of relation that often begins with influence. And a good parody can be extraordinarily original, but it cannot exist without the original. So, can a parody ever exceed the poem that it imitates? Can a reflection outshine its source? Here is Matthew Arnold's Dover Beach, first published in 1867, but probably written much earlier, in the weeks following his marriage to Frances Lucy Whiteman in 1851. Now, it offers us a disillusioned lover on a cliff by the sea, contemplating the precipice of his own life. The sea is calm tonight. The tide is full. The moon lies fair upon the straits. On the French coast, the light gleams and is gone. The cliffs of England stand, glimmering and vast, out in the tranquil bay. Come to the window. Sweet is the night air. Only from the long line of spray where the sea meets the moon-blanched land. Listen, you hear the grating roar of pebbles which the waves draw back and fling at their return up the high strand. Begin and cease, and then again begin with tremulous cadence slow and bring the eternal note of sadness in. Sophocles, long ago, heard it on the Aegean, and it brought into his mind the turbid ebb and flow of human misery. We find also in the sound a thought, hearing it by this distant northern sea. The sea of faith was once, too, at the full, and round earth's shore lay like the folds of a bright girdle furled. But now I only hear its melancholy, long, withdrawing roar, retreating to the breath of the night wind, down the vast edges drear and naked shingles of the world. Ah, love, let us be true to one another, for the world which seems to lie before us, like a land of dreams, so various, so beautiful, so new, hath really neither joy, nor love, nor light, nor certitude, nor peace, nor help for pain. And we are here, as on a darkling plain, swept with confused alarms of struggle and flight, where ignorant armies clash by night. These lines seem to have been composed in accordance with the two offices of poetry Arnold had declared so important in a letter to a friend a few years prior. Quote, to add to one's thoughts and feelings and to compose and elevate the mind by a sustained tone, numerous allusions, and a grand style. Now, this is certainly a poem of feelings and thoughts. In the sound of thought, Arnold writes, and he's describing the sea, but he's also describing the music of his own poem. And he manages, manages to sustain his tone across four quirkily rhymed stanzas full of suspenseful enjambments, each stanza, I think, bearing some relation to a sonnet. The first stanza, as you can see, is 14 lines. The second and third add up to exactly that many. And the fourth addresses itself to the lover who receives those imperatives, come to the window and listen near the beginning. And at the time that we first heard them, we might have read those commands as maybe being directed towards us as readers, but not at the end. If the illusions do elevate the mind, Arnold's poem offers many, and they signal a broader classicism bound up in his references to Sophocles and Thucydides, whose histories include that famous night battle on a darkling plain where the ignorant soldiers couldn't tell friend from foe, and also in his poem's carefully measured grand style. Upon the straits, moon-blanched land, vast edges drear, ah, love, the high rhetoric of these phrases demands that this poem be taken seriously. And readers always have done, until Anthony Hecht got his hands on it. 
Oops. The Dover Bitch, a criticism of life for Andrews Wanning. So there stood Matthew Arnold and this girl with the cliffs of England crumbling away behind them, and he said to her, Try to be true to me, and I'll do the same for you, for things are bad all over, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, now, I knew this girl. It's true she had read Sophocles in a fairly good translation and caught that bitter allusion to the sea, but all the time he was talking, she had in mind the notion of what his whiskers would feel like on the back of her neck. She told me later on that after a while, she got to looking out at the lights across the channel and felt really felt sad, thinking of all the wine and enormous beds and blandishments and French and the perfumes. And then she got really angry to have been brought all the way down from London and then be addressed as a sort of mournful cosmic last resort is really tough on a girl, and she was pretty. Anyway, she watched him pace the room and finger his watch chain and seemed to sweat a bit, and then she said one or two unprintable things, but you mustn't judge her by that. What I mean to say is, she's really all right. I still see her once in a while, and she always treats me right. We have a drink, and I give her a good time, and perhaps it's a year before I see her again. But there she is, running to fat, but dependable as they come. And sometimes I bring her a bottle of Nuit de Mort. When Hecht included this poem in his second collection, The Hard Hours, in 1967, exactly one century after Dover Beach appeared, he may not have imagined himself as being wholly serious. But perhaps he did. Like Arnold, he had composed his version many years before its publication in the book, during the throes not of marriage, but separation and divorce. Hecht invents a speaker contemporaneous with Arnold's who knew the female addressee of the original poem even more intimately, perhaps, than the man on the cliff, and he presents us with her side of the story. All the time he was talking, she had in mind the notion of what his whiskers would feel like on the back of her neck. This sexually frustrated woman must have felt, as so many of Arnold's critics have, that the man she found herself with in Dover was something of a melancholic prude. Hecht's poem attempts to liberate her. She's really all right. I give her a good time, and winkingly sends her off with a bottle of one of those French perfu perfumes that she so covets. And yet I want to propose that the tone of the book to which this poem belongs, which won the Hewlett Pulitzer Prize and contains some of Hecht's most harrowing poems about the Holocaust, suggests that we maybe should read his epigraph, which plays on Arnold's assertion that good poems are a criticism of life, in earnest rather than in jest. Is Hecht's parody, in fact, a criticism of life rather than merely a criticism of Arnold? When Arnold uses this phrase in his essay, The Study of Poetry, he's defending good poetry's ability to interpret life for us, to console us, to sustain us. In poetry, our race will find consolation and stay. But the consolation, he says, and stay will be of power in proportion to the power of the criticism of life. And the criticism of life will be of power in proportion as the poetry conveying it is excellent rather than inferior, sound rather than unsound or half sound, true rather than untrue or half true. For Arnold, a poem's criticism of life is only as effective as how excellent rather than inferior it is. Excellence being a quality that, as he writes elsewhere in the essay, relies on, quote, the high seriousness which comes from absolute sincerity. A reader certainly feels his dedication to sincerity in that final exclamatory appeal in Dover Beach, let us be true to one another. For him, poetry accommodates the truths that life can't fully articulate, the ones that you hear in sounds uh, as much as in thoughts. Life needs poets the way poems need critics. But Hecht may have had something more cynical in mind in reproducing Arnold's phrase. 
His poem appears to critique, critique the seedier aspects of life, not just in its allusions to casual sex, but also in his deplorable description of the girl's running to fat and the fact that her translation of Sophocles is only fairly good. Even the perfume he offers her, its name suggesting the one night stand, isn't classy. Nuit de Mort is an everyday perfume hecht plucked from his own mid-century American milieu, neither true to Arnold's world nor anything like what classy 19th century French women wore. And I know this because I have been looking to see whether this perfume really exists. Um, and I managed to find a bottle from the 1950s in an online shop for American, uh, uh, vintage Americana. And here it is, I bought it, it wasn't expensive. Um, but I really hope the man brought her a bigger bottle than this little thing. So, for Arnold, I think sincerity would have seemed to require something less ironic, less anachronistic, less dramatic than what Hecht produces. And yet, sincerity in Dover Beach is complicated as well. Arnold's tone is sincere sounding, to be sure, but is the poem. Arnold himself was actually a famously jovial young man. His demeanor was nothing like that of the disillusioned speaker that we encounter at Dover. Lionel Trilling notes in his biography that when Arnold's first volume of poems appeared, Quote, Matthew's friends and family were puzzled that a book by so gay a young man should be so sad. Now, it could be the case that the performance of his public demeanor called for a kind of sincerity that only poetry was able to deliver. And it is certainly the case that the facts of Dover Beach do match the biographical details of Arnold's life. He visited Dover many times during the period when he likely wrote the poem, although the exact moment of its composition is still a mystery. Uh, and in fact, the only surviving draft is unfinished. This is a kind of typed up version obviously. Um, it sits on the back of another poem. We know that he was composing between 1850 and 1852. And what's more, you can see in the last lines of the draft version, the, the very last line of the draft is, ah, love, etc. This seems to gesture to the finished poem's final stanza as if it were already written down somewhere else. So were Arnold's closing lines about love actually written before the rest of the poem? Maybe were they even written about another woman? We know Arnold brought his new wife, Frances, to Dover early in the summer of 1851, and again later in September when they took the night ferry from there to Calais. She described the crossing in a letter to her mother. The sea, she wrote, was calm as a mill pond. Is this the calm sea that Arnold's poem describes? Now, I think this matters because reading Dover Beach not just as a love poem, but as an autobiographical honeymoon poem informs its religious and romantic cadences. And the mystery of why it doesn't appear in Arnold's 1852 volume, Empedocles on Etna and Other Poems, which also contains other poems about a woman named Marguerite, continues to be a source of speculation. Did his wife Frances disapprove of the religious sentiments in Dover Beach and ask her husband to leave it out? Or was the poem simply not romantic enough, as Hecht impishly suggests? Not every bride would relish hearing such melancholy speeches from their groom. The world hath really neither joy, nor love, nor light, nor certitude, nor peace, nor help for pain. I mean, this may be sincere, but it is not uplifting. On the other hand, it is possible to feel, as Trilling suggests, an overriding sense of warm, tender, pathetic love in Dover Beach. I certainly do. The opening leads the reader into expecting iambic pentameter. The sea is calm tonight, only to stop short at Trimeter before having another go. The tide is full, the moon lies fair, only to reach tetrameter before finally landing five beats in the third line. It's clearly building at something. As he sputters into ignition, Arnold's speaker lets us know that whatever he's getting at isn't going to be easy to say. So rather than getting right to it, 
he spends 20 lines retreating into metaphor, allowing those waves near the end of the first 14 line stanza, which begin and cease and then again begin to depict visually the ambivalence enacted in the out and back measure of those first three lines. These lines also mirror what is happening in the poem's form. At this moment, the sonnet is about to prove inadequate to his lyrics, so he must begin again. What exactly is this poet trying to say? His difficulty articulating the thoughts occasioned by this place and time is part of the tonal complexity of Dover Beach and ultimately part of its beauty. To stand at the edge of the world which seems to lie before us, knowing that you are ensconced in meeting that you cannot decipher, demonstrates the existential predicament of a man given to symbolic gestures and dramatic speech acts. Here is where verse offers itself as the only medium adequate to the sincerity that Arnold requires. As such, the first half of Arnold's poem reads as a kind of meta-poem. It spends two stanzas dwelling on the high rhetoric of cadences and notes, waves, ebbs, flows, before finally piercing the heart of the matter. The dwindling sea of faith and its possible recompense and the steadiness of faithful love. Now, to my ear, these lines are more beautiful than desolate. But if they do represent honeymoon poetry, they are also pathetic in both senses of that word. One can see why Hecht, an admirer of Arnold's, felt the urge to poke fun. He would not have spent his honeymoon contemplating the existence of God while begging his wife to stay faithful. Now, Hecht's first honeymoon was, in fact, spent uh, in New York's Fire Island. But he did take his wife, Pat, a fashion model, to Paris shortly after, where they were, by most accounts, extremely unhappy. But faithfulness and spirituality do become lasting subjects, poetic subjects, for Hecht. So perhaps the mood of his parody is truer to the original than it initially seems. In a letter he wrote in 1992, Hecht explains that he felt a marked impatience with Arnold's way of making love into a form of redemption and substitution for any other form of transcendent experience. Putting that much weight on human fidelity, he says, in a love relationship, is to burden it beyond the limits of any lightness or carefree spontaneity. It was to make love into something grimly solemn, like Victorian organ music, for which the word lugubrious could have been coined. The poem accordingly presents a female protagonist longing for what she imagines to be the carefree spontaneity of lovers on the other side of the channel. And yet, like Arnold's speaker, she deals in feelings that are hard to say. The wandering, yearning thoughts associated with phrases like, all the time he was talking she had in mind, and after a while she got to looking out at the lights across the channel and felt really sad. These are not a far cry from the wayward patterns of thinking her lover displays as he's watching the waves, remembering Sophocles and Thucydides in Arnold's version. Both of them are living elsewhere, he in ancient books, she in body fantasies of France. And like Arnold's speaker, the male narrator of Hecht's poem also requires some time to articulate his point. What I mean to say is, he sputters most of the way through the poem, trying to locate the truth that his verse hasn't quite achieved yet. And so the ending of the parody closely matches Arnold's in sentiment, if not in tone. Hecht offers a lonely portrait of ultimate discord between lovers. He finds her dependable, thinks she is all right, and congratulates himself on providing her with a cheap bottle of perfume, tiny, and an outlet to talk but she is surely using him too. He is her mournful cosmic last resort. Hecht has produced yet another version of those ignorant armies clashing by night. Does he know it? In other words, is this dramatic irony or just plain old misogyny? Readers have been divided since the beginning. 
Edward Hirsch considers the Dover bitch an integral player in the seriousness of Hecht's prize-winning collection and reads the poem as simultaneously parodic and distinctly Arnoldian, seeking, he says, to, quote, deflate a certain type of rhetoric, searching out and exposing the false and phony, puncturing the heroic gesture. That's Edward Hirsch. But Marianne Corbett has recently, recently noted, we're nagged by the thought that the woman herself wouldn't want to be seen or described in this way, not smart enough to know a fairly good translation from an excellent one, merely pretty and valued primarily by the standard of prettiness, satisfied with the annual one night stand, becoming less and less attractive, bought off with the occasional bottle of Nuit de Mour. Hecht appears not to have anticipated this sort of response. In the same letter that I just quoted, he explains, on the basis of both the poem and its title, I have been accused of sexism, though when I wrote the poem, I intended only to bring a spirit of levity and informality to the relations between men and women in the person of Arnold's poem. This light defense appears to leave open the possibility for unintentional meanings, even as he claims his own innocence. And Hecht was wise to Freudian concepts and underwent psychoanalysis for many years. But he does not elaborate on the extent to which his investment in those persons of Arnold's poem takes advantages of complexities in voice and persona, complexities that were important to Arnold, but even more so to his contemporaries Tennyson and Robert Browning. Several of Hecht's readers, including Corbett, gesture towards these qualities in his poem, although they don't explicitly name them as dramatic. But it seems to me that the success of the Dover bitch really hangs on its living up to this designation uh, as a dramatic monologue. Jonathan Post calls the Dover bitch Hecht's notorious bad boy poem, and Corbett acknowledges that she believes Hecht knows very well how bad this narrator looks. David Yezzi, in order to exonerate Hecht from seemingly, seeming crass and condescending, explains this is a persona, and the poem adopts a callous view of male-female relations in which the speaker and, in his own way, the poet are left very much on the hook. Now, in fact, these sorts of anxieties regarding authorial personality are the very ones upon which most successful dramatic monologues turn. Hecht actually wrote several virtuosic dramatic monologues throughout his career, and he comments in several interviews that lyric poems should not necessarily reflect whatever is going on in the poet's turbulent psyche. He says, I have in fact tried to disguise myself in my poems and have adopted the voices of persons wholly different from me, including women. Novelists do this sort of thing all the time, while many readers and critics seem to deny this privilege to the poet or to doubt that he is able to do it. Some of the most grotesque misreadings of my poems have been made by those who assume that all my poems are voiced in propria persona. It might seem appropriate to hear Hecht himself in the speaker of the Dover Bitch because of the timing of its publication. It first appeared in the Transatlantic Review as he was separating from his wife, and even more so because of its earnest sounding epigraph, an anti-Arnoldian complaint about romantic and spiritual life. But Heck points out that he was greatly irritated by critics and general readers who assumed for a long time that everything I wrote was purely about myself. And for that reason, I went out of my way to choose the voices of women, women who could not possibly be me. Now, one obvious reason that the speaker of Hecht in, in Dover Beach could not possibly be Hecht himself is that he was not alive in the 1850s to seduce Arnold's girl. But the voice in the poem is nevertheless profoundly contemporary and profoundly male. So why isn't this poem, ostensibly written to give Arnold's girl a voice, actually spoken by her as it could have been? Perhaps this is the poem's fatal flaw. Or perhaps the fact that his poem trades one male lover for another keeps it safely in the realm of parody. The woman's perspective once again gets subsumed in a man's meditative fantasies about what he has to offer her and she to him. The criticism that Hecht achieves is more fully on show this way. 
we have a drink and I give her a good time, these lines constitute the laddish confessions of a specific man seemingly directed at another likely male listener. And it, this listener may just be Andrews Wanning, uh, who was a colleague of Hecht's at Smith College. But whoever he is, Hecht winds up presenting him with a persona as the argument. Reading the poem this way throws other aspects of its voicedness into relief. So there stood Matthew Arnold and his girl, and well now, I knew this girl, and what I mean to say is, so these are all colloquial phrases which help deflate the poem's rhetoric, as Hirsch puts it, and also help render its main character. They clue the reader into what sort of man this lover is. The, the way that Hecht slowly leads us to condemn his initially likable speaker makes a seemingly light verse dramatic and many-layered. It also may be what makes his parody most significantly Arnoldian. Christopher Ricks touches admiring, admiringly on this element of Hecht's poem. Anthony Hecht's brilliant and poignant poem is by no means flippant. It takes Arnold and Dover Beach seriously, so seriously as to consider awe or reverence insufficiently heartfelt as a response. And then, having subjected Arnold to an unprecedented skepticism, it turns in its own light, and we suddenly see the superiority of Arnold and all he epitomized to that knowing speaker whose worldliness was at first so refreshing. When Ricks writes that the poem turns in its own light, he presumably means that the cynical worldliness of the knowing speaker begins to darken the moral landscape of the verse. And here, of course, is where Arnold shines. Yet there may also be reasons to call up Arnold on similar grounds. Our ambivalence about Hecht's speaker begins to mirror the ambivalence that many readers of Arnold, including perhaps perhaps Hecht, have found themselves feeling about his speaker, who is, after all, standing at one of England's most beautiful shores, maybe on his honeymoon, with a woman that he claims to love, and yet nevertheless disheartened and world-weary. In other words, for all of his seeming sincerity, Arnold's man doesn't come off entirely clean that Hecht's parody replicates the slow trajectory of this inconsistency is, I think, one of its most impressive virtues. Now, how conscious was Hecht of this structural and tonal overlap? Could Hecht have known about the existence of Arnold's, par Arnold's partial manuscript of Dover Beach when he paraphrases its last stanza at the beginning of his own poem? Try to be true to me, and I'll do the same for you, for things are bad all over, etc., etc. Heck's cavalier mockery here of a sentiment so utterly sincere in Arnold feel, feels like mere good fun, until one remembers that Arnold himself had adopted a similar tone when referring to these very lines, which he had presumably already composed at the end of his draft. But now I only hear its melancholy, long, withdrawing roar retreating to the breath of the night wind down the vast edges drear and naked shingles of the world. Ah, love, etc. In Arnold's draft's Victorian shorthand, we are briefly privy to a rare splitting off of poet from speaker. Ah, love, etc. He scribbles, cheerily waving himself on. His et cetera there has the jauntiness of a poet mid-composition who has just seen his way to the end of his poem. Now, it is not impossible that Hecht was consciously mimicking Arnold's et cetera when he writes et cetera, et cetera in his poem, although I do think it's very unlikely. But even if he wasn't aware of the draft, the notes of authorial distance that he strikes in his own poem through its dramatic elements appear to model themselves on the tricky relation between the poet of Dover Beach and its speaker. Through a small chink in the wall, Arnold's own etc., we can detect in the original poem something like the ironic distance that Hecht so carefully develops in his. To label Dover Beach something akin to a dramatic monologue is not so very large a leap. Several aspects of it call into question its high seriousness and sincerity in Arnoldian terms. One is the girdle. 
Now, if we imagine Arnold's poem encompassing four distinct sections, the first one describing the cliffs and the sea, the second one connecting them to classical sources, the third expressing anxiety over a loss of faith, and the fourth addressing a beloved as a form of recompense, then why the mild innuendo in a stanza about religion? The sea of faith was once, too, at the full, and round Earth's shore lay like the folds of a bright girdle furled. It is unexpected, to be sure, though not necessarily inaccurate, as figures go. I think you could sort of imagine the sea with its frothy, overlapping layers of white caps looking something like a tightened Victorian girdle. And likewise, you could maybe sort of imagine those waves eventually lengthening out or unfurling the way the folds of a girdle might do if you undo it. <laughs> but to associate the loosening with a loss of faith, the long withdrawing roar, is to paint a moment of really serious religious doubt into a scene of undressing. Now, this may not be inconsistent with the poem's final sentiments, or indeed with its subsequent outcry, ah, love, but it is not in keeping with the tone of austerity that Arnold has established, nor do those naked shingles, referring most obviously, I know, I know, to pebbles on the beach, but also picking up, as several critics before me have noted, the other meaning of naked and shingles. Shingles, which is an eruptive disease, often extending around the middle of the body. And the word shingles, as both Timothy O'Brien and Paul Muldoon have pointed out, derives from the Latin kingulum, which means, of all things, girdle. My comments feel unseemly, I know, given the high tone of the rest of the poem. And yet we know that Arnold thought carefully about the word girdle because his prior draft has the word garment instead. The word may work alongside some of the poem's subtler notes of voiced masculinity to rebut scholarly treatments that accuse Arnold's poem of lacking sexual vitality. Hecht's poem is one of those critiques that Arnold's poem leaves out, or tries to leave out with only mixed success, the sexual elements of a honeymoon night is what makes way for a poem like Hecht's. But as I've been arguing, Arnold himself may also have been staging a critique. The knowingness of a poet who selects shingles after using the word girdle, who is likely aware from his classical education at rugby school of the etymological connection between these, these two words, suggests to me that Arnold is not a poet easily self-deceived, whereas his speaker may well be. And there are other inconsistencies within the poem that might also be chalked up to the tremulous emotional state of this pathetic lover rather than Arnold himself. One is the vexed question of Arnold's tides, which Robert Graves thinks Arnold muddled with the ebb and flow of particular waves. Several critics have complained about those over the years. And another is the fact that the poem is called Dover Beach, when it actually appears to have been taking place on the cliffs. Now, these interpretive cruxes are not necessarily flaws. And in fact, they may be tied to what I like best about Arnold's poem which is the persistent pathos of his dramatic persona. But they do call into question that rubric of Arnoldian sincerity with which Hecht's parody so fruitfully plays. Another threat to Arnold's sincerity is the way his poem appeals to so many sources. How could a poem so elusive and scholarly remain fully sincere? For instance, is it possible that Dover Beach is itself a parody? Readers familiar with Wordsworth's early poetry may think so. It is a beauteous evening, calm and free, writes Arnold's mentor, predecessor, and perhaps greatest influence, as he himself looked toward Dover across the English Channel from Calais in 1802. It is a beauteous evening, calm and free. The holy time is quiet as a nun, breathless, breathless with adoration. The broad sun is sinking down in its tranquility. The gentleness of heaven broods over the sea. Listen, the mighty being is awake and doth with his eternal motion make a sound like thunder everlastingly. 
the setting by the channel, the time of day, the sea, religion, the silent female addressee who does appear later in this poem. Arnold carries all of these elements from Wordsworth's poem into his own first stanza, along with many of the same words, calm, tranquil, eternal, and the real giveaway, listen. Now, I am, of course, not the first to notice these connections. Critics have been clamoring on about Arnold's sources for Dover Beach for many decades, pointing variously to Sophocles, to King Lear, who stood on these very cliffs, Paradise Lost. And you can compare, for instance, um, Milton's The World Was All Before Them to Arnold's The World Which Seems to Lie Before Us, and so on. My point is not that Arnold's poem is unoriginal, but rather that its derivativeness reminds us that while he may seem sincere, he is simultaneously part of a long-standing trope in a similar way to Hecht's own speaker. Arnold's source material ensures his speaker is many-layered. Simultaneously himself, Lear, Adam, Wordsworth, anyone but Arnold as Arnold. The allusions teach us to read him contextually, just as theorists of the dramatic monologue, the Victorian dramatic monologue, have persuasively shown us how to do with reference to so many characters and personae in the poems of Tennyson and Browning. Hecht's lover, with his seedy charisma, historically framed details, and subtlety of character, may well appear more like one of Browning's persona than Arnold's. And this may add to the virtuosity of his parody. For on some level, I think, Hecht manages to stage, and maybe perhaps unconsciously, a contest that was being staged in Arnold's time. Arnold was not England's best dramatic poet. Surely that was Robert Browning, though he certainly wrote many poems as fine or finer than many of Browning's. And so the extent to which Hecht's speaker is stronger or at least pers more persuasive than Arnold's may well be the extent to which Browning might have treated a Victorian audience to a more dramatic, more ironic take on the situation at Dover in a language more meaningfully believable than Arnold did. But fantasizing over what kind of guy Browning would have put on Dover's cliffs does a disservice to the impressive balance Arnold manages to cultivate in his poem between sincerity and drama. And anyway, the contest at hand isn't between Browning and Arnold, but Arnold and Hecht. Hecht's parody, we can see, is not exactly Arnoldian in style. Or rather, its style is exactly not Arnoldian, characterized by overt eroticism and a breezy forthrightness of tone. In achieving this difference, Hecht unconsciously reproduces what he consciously undoes, a disenchanted knowingness on the part of the author at the expense of the speaker that requires the readers to untangle. The dramatic irony in both poems is that neither lover, neither Arnold nor Hecht's, has a solid grip on how he comes across. Both speakers display a sense of desperation at how things are, they criticize life, and yet both are also part of the problem. Arnold's speaker cannot achieve Arnold's own knowingness, nor does the lover in Hecht's poem quite live up to the earnestness Hecht finds himself offering in the form of an Arnoldian criticism of life. It may be perfect mimicry on Hecht's part, the consummate parody, or it may be a trap he has serendipitously fallen into from one side of imitation's door. John Bailey once described Keatsian parody in terms of the balance that poet, a poet achieves between being too knowingly parodic and unintentionally losing himself in imitation. Hecht's poem finds this balance, I think. It presents itself as intentionally parodic and un-Arnoldian. But in doing so, it achieves a likeness to the original that would not have otherwise been possible. The Dover bitch opens as deliberately as any orthodox parody whose point and protection, writes Bailey, is never to deceive its reader into supposing it be the real thing but it quickly loses itself in unintentional likeness. And here is where Hecht's poem stands a chance at surpassing Arnold's, since the truest parodies may also be unparodic. 
Parody's paradox is its desire to unessence itself, to become rather than to betray the original. So who wrote Dover better? I know you're all wondering whether I will do the foolishly courageous thing and declare Hecht's parody better than one of the 19th century's greatest poems. And if I were judging on sincerity alone, I do think Hecht wins, since his poem not only sets out to critique Arnold's, but also to affect within it the criticism of life his predecessor saw as inherent in all good poetry. He achieves these aims by adopting a dramatic stance that allows his poem, first intentionally, and then probably unintentionally, to interpret both Dover Beach, the poem, and also the feelings of its desperate speaker, who in the end provides an unlikely model for his own. However, I am afraid that Arnold cannot be bested. I have mainly discussed the biographical and dramatic elements of his famous poem. But its descriptive and formal qualities are, of course, what has established it as Arnold's strongest lyric and one of English poetry's most memorable productions. That its stanzas bend toward but will not produce the sonnet form is both musically suspenseful and indicative of their speaker's ambivalence about tradition, religious and literary. It's grand style, to use Arnold's phrase, and many allusions recall prior poems whose own meanings and melodies help elevate the tone. And of course, the sudden and yet inevitable apostrophe to the beloved in stanza four allows what might have been called a stock character to inhabit fully, if momentarily, his own persona. Arnold ironically comes closest in that ah love to betraying himself. Heck's poem is clever. It's natural seeming and formal enough, although it's nowhere near as virtuosic as Heck's other experiments in form. But it neither aspires to nor achieves the same level of beauty as Arnold's poem. Actually, what really fuels my belief in the superiority of Arnold's poem is the way that it knowingly transforms its own parodic elements as it encounters Wordsworth, Sophocles, Shakespeare, and Milton in turn into an original blend of the dramatic and seemingly personal. By inventing a speaker who claims so much of the poet's own literary disposition and yet, who because of his innocence and utter pathos cannot quite be him, Arnold devises his own version of the dramatic form that would later come to define his poetic era. And he does so all the while encompassing the questioning spirit of his age in a language nevertheless convincingly private and directed at the beloved. Hecht's parody is admirably multivalenced, but it does not unpeel into so many layers. Another way of putting this is to say that Arnold's poem has more of truth and seriousness than Hecht's. We know Arnold cared for these qualities and spoke powerfully to them and to the relevance of judgment in his lectures and essays. The superior character of truth and seriousness in the matter and substance of the best poetry, he declares in the study of poetry, is inseparable from the superiority of diction and movement marking its style and manner. Can it still be the case a century and a half later? Are these still reasonable aesthetic criteria for us? I think so, and I think Hecht believed in them too. Poets can be bad as they can be good in any number of ways, Hecht once wrote, explaining how too often poems fail the way a joke badly told will fail. The teller sits back, grinning in foolish triumph and still more foolish expectation of uproarious laughter only to be greeted by embarrassed silence. The Dover bitch is not a joke told badly, nor is it in bad taste. But it is a poem that opens with a promise it can only partially fulfill, because to criticize life in the Arnoldian sense requires more than parody's parameters easily allow. Now, you still may be wondering what the purpose of this exercise in judgment has been. <laughs> To whom should it matter that I think that Arnold wrote the winning poem? I'm not the first or the thousandth reader to praise Dover Beach. 
But reading it against Hecht's poem has transformed my own appreciation of it. The act of judging improved my reading. Evaluation is like that. It prioritizes, it gives structure, it brings into focus, it throws into relief. Declaring one poem better than another need not disqualify the losing poem from having value. Indeed, the opposite is likely to be the case. By exonerating the losing poem from its pressures of quality, by taking it for what it is, we can see better what value lies in it. Sometimes a poem's greatness is only partial, and sometimes this only becomes apparent when reading it in relative terms. In her book, The Limits of Critique, Rita Felsky has explained somewhat ruefully why the kinds of subjective interpretation inherent to evaluative readings have become anathema in our discipline. She says, there is an understandable wariness of being tarred with the brush of subjective or emotional response. And yet subjectivity is also what allows us our creativity and honesty as readers and what differentiates us from each other. What I argue about Arnold's poem will never be exactly what you argue about it, not just because texts always mean many things in many ways, but because the personally inflected way that we make our arguments affects the meaning of what we say. A renewed effort at critical subjectivity in the form of evaluative reading may helpfully loosen the parameters of literary study as long as we are honest about what we're doing. Now, it can be difficult to tell the difference between subjective and objective judgments in the criticism that we read. As I've been thinking about the critical advantages that might come from my pitting one poem against another, I am reminded how F.R. Levis, a critic whose reputation has not exactly increased over time, once confessed his determination to find a way of, quote, getting beyond a neutrally descriptive account of the differences between two poems. Indeed, after pronouncing a poem by Tennyson, decidedly inferior to one by D.H. Lawrence, Levis declares that the comparison is not gratuitous, a puritanic intrusion of critical righteousness, because, he says, the readiness to make the kind of judgment that the comparison enforces is implicit in any sound response to Tennyson's poem. Now, I think his point here goes well beyond the evaluation of the two poems he's comparing. He's describing the implicit judgment involved in any critical act. His analysis demonstrates how comparison becomes a tool and how we all rate, discern, judge, evaluate. It happens even when the two objects being compared are not directly before us. When we read a poem, any poem, we involve ourselves, mostly unconsciously, in the act of comparing it to all the other poems we've ever encountered. And if we go on to pronounce it better or worse than this one or that one, doing so is only the articulation of the critical process that's happening intuitively as we read. To judge is to prioritize what matters over what doesn't matter quite as much. Now, Levis was not especially tactful in how he imposed his judgments. But he may well have learned his process from Arnold, whose development of literary critical style grew out of a belief that poetry, too, is a kind of evaluative criticism of life as well as other poems. And Hecht knew this, too. Judging is part of the act of reading, as it is part of any aesthetic experience in our lives. And the one can hardly happen without the other. So I'm going to finish now. What happens when the parody gets parodied? The woman finally gets a voice. The Dover bitch criticizes her life. After Hecht, after Arnold. I am waiting on the beach. Soon the car door will slam, then Shingle will mutter grudgingly under his feet. He will come. He will keep the old promise. I will not turn around. We'll meet with the light behind me. A year is a long time. Here's where we first met in the far off days when I was a poet's muse. How he laughed at me then, laughed till we fell serious, fell accidentally into bed, since when again and again we have fallen together, though the fallings are growing further and further apart. This is how it will be, a kiss, a meal somewhere decent, a wine from across the water for old time's sake, and afterwards, tipsy and sad, 
I will treat him right. I'll treat him to all the year's longings in one great lay. I will nurse him to sleep on breasts that are not what they were. Try not to consider the different levels of love. Oh, my beloved and sensitive, cynical swine. I want him here, sharing old jokes and taking the piss out of my O-level Greek. A year is a long time, but I am still Persephone, albeit gone to seed, six months remembering, then six anticipating. Heaven knows I was never a greedy woman, but I hope he remembers the bottle of Nuit no more. I'm almost out. And that's what gets me through between times. The merest whiff on a tissue shushes the fears, tempers the imaginings, takes the raw edge off the, no the gnawing knowing that my long loss is someone else's gain. To pit Anne Drysdale's parody against Hecht's requires a whole other lecture, but if I were to stage such a contest, it would involve laughing until we fell serious because to parody a serious poem is to do more than merely imitate or poke fun. Drysdale's poem has the seriousness of criticism to which Arnold and Hecht both aspire. Oscar Wilde's dictum, which, with which I began, is itself, if you take it whole, evaluative. Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery that mediocrity can pay to greatness. Heck's poem is not mediocre, nor does it merely imitate Arnold, but it does flatter him. That it does so seemingly unintentionally is what marks it as an excellent poem, a poem of truth and seriousness in the most Arnoldian sense. Thank you. Erica, thank you very much for a wonderfully um, perceptive and wide-ranging and incredibly um, engaging lecture. I was transfixed for 55 minutes, which is, which is quite some, some task. Um, we have some time for lecture, for questions now, um, and I'm sure there will be a few. Um, so please uh, feel free to raise your hand. Um, before you do so, wait till the mic reaches you so that we can capture it for the audience um, at home. Jeremy. Shall I do it? I'm afraid so. <laughs> Hi, okay. Thank you for that uh, lecture and, and for the Anne Drysdale poem at the, at the end, which I'm guessing probably most people didn't know. I, I'd never read it before. Um, I, and it, it got me thinking, which I was sort of thinking earlier on, uh, about the word parody, which you were using, uh, and this question of valuing, because it seems to me that, that the argument that, that you were making about Hex poem sort of values it more than parody. Would that be a reasonable thing to say? Is, is, is parody itself a word that is perhaps sort of Falling putting out of the Hex in a, in, a, in a box? I, I think... Um I think I value parody a great deal, or maybe it's Hecht's poem who, that, that has taught me um, what parody is capable of. Um, but the Drysdale poem does the same thing, doesn't it? I mean, it takes, it takes parody further than you might think parody would normally go. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I think before I started thinking about parody, I assumed it was light verse, jokey, um, meant to poke fun and criticize, not in the Arnoldian sense, but just in the kind of complaining sense. I now do think of parody as uh, an imitative art and one that at its best I don't know, wants to achieve the greatness of the original. I can't see why else you would spend the time to write the thing. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, I, yeah. Um, I'm 
I'm trying to think. I suppose something I, I would look for in parody is, is a sort of stylistic imitation, which doesn't seem to be what Hector's doing. So I wonder, does that complicate it, or is that just too narrow a definition? No, of that's parody? a great question. It's a great question, and it does complicate it. You know, when I started writing this, I got maybe a few pages in, and I thought, oh no, first of all, this isn't a parody at all. Hmm. It's, you know, a companion poem or, you know, some kind of. Um, response. But the, the more I got involved, the more I do think it actually stylistically mirrors the original. And I think that's, that's what made this task so productive for me. It was only when I started thinking about Hecht's poem as a dramatic monologue that I clocked that Arnold's poem too is a kind of dramatic poem, and that what makes Hecht's poem most valuable, most interesting to me, is the way it manages to mirror some of the dramatic complexities. So although the diction, if, if we're thinking about things that make up style, although the diction isn't the same, the style might be, or might be more similar than you would initially think. Um, and I'm grateful to Hecht for helping me read and understand Dover Beach better. I, I have a better sense of the style of Dover Beach now that I have read it alongside the style of Hecht, <laughs> hilariously and unexpectedly. We have a question just here. Would you say, say then that the two parodies are actually brilliant forms of literary criticism which say things more subtly than perhaps an essay might? Well, poetry always says things more subtly than essays do, uh, than literary criticism does in, in my book. But yes, I would. And I, I, think, um, I think that's also one of the special elements of Hecht's poem, which brands itself as a criticism of life, but is some al somehow also connected it to it being a criticism of Arnold's poem. And I think the Drysdale is really brilliant at that. If only all the literary critics were poets, imagine what could be achieved. <laughs> Do we have any more questions? Uh, David first, and then I think there's one. Is there one at the back? Can we sort? Yeah. Um, thanks very much. Um, this is um, a slightly different question, I guess. Sort of towards the end, when you were saying that Arnold was better than, or the Arnold poem is better than Hecht, with which I absolutely agree, by the way. Um, you said that it had more truth and seriousness than Hecht's poem. And I just wanted to ask you a bit more about why those are the criteria, because you then went and slightly defended those criteria, but then didn't really go on. Are they the criteria that you're deriving from the encounter between these two poems, or in your kind of list of criteria for evaluative judgments of all poetry? Thank you so much for asking that. The truth that. and sincerity kind of come <laughs> top. No, they don't. They are the criteria that I'm drawing from the relation between these two poems. But it is one of the hardest aspects of this project for me, is trying to work through um, what aesthetic criteria I feel I can reasonably draw on without getting myself in a whole lot of trouble. Um, this was, in certain ways, an easy project because Arnold himself is so comfortable <laughs> laying out aesthetic criteria for good poems. And I think Hecht is, cares about that and is thinking about that as he plays with, parodies, imitates, aspires to Arnold's poem. Now, what are my criteria? I started off by saying this was not going to be a theory of aesthetic judgment. Um, and that's, that's because I don't write aesthetic theory. <laughs> um, I want this to be an experiment. And the book I'm writing that has lots of chapters like this with lots of pairings of lots of different kinds of poems from different periods, I hope will um, be loose and draw from lots of aesthetic criteria. 
I, th I think the safest way is to make a reading of a poem that somehow feels truthful to its own, uh, its author's own intentions according to its greatness. I know intention is slippery, it's a tricky subject, but I am a real believer in the importance of intentionality. So I guess as I read poems, my hope is, is to try and read, read the success or failure of each text based on you know, what I think the author wanted for it or tried to achieve with it. And then if I want to impose my own judgments, you know, maybe at the end for fun, I would want to do so while being very clear with my reader that those are just my opinions. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to dictate to you what aesthetic criteria we should be using when we read. So we have a question from Tom Ben, who's watching on the live stream, who first wants to say a wonderful lecture on these two poems um, and that they love the generous notion of the text's partial greatness being revealed through comparative close reading. Um, and then they ask, Eagleton claimed that we always interpret literary works in the light of our own concerns. How should the critic contend with her own positionality in relation to the text under critique? And does positionality inevitably shape the critic's value judgments and inform how she responds in her evaluative as well as her analytical criticism? And then lastly, is evaluative criticism then a form of gatekeeping, the critic arguing for her own aesthetic tastes and standards and the flattering of her own moral or ideological sensibilities? Thank you, Tom. I should have written notes as I was listening. <laughs> That's a really good question, though. I'll try and answer as much of that as possible, as concisely as possible. Um, I do think pos positionality plays into it. Uh, it's a risk, but it might also be a benefit. Um, I know that any opinion I will have about value comes from my own experience. And I think this is what I was trying to say about Levis at the very end of this talk, which is that he wasn't always, um, he didn't always persuade his reader because he wasn't always tactful about his own positionality. Um, and I think much of his criticism can come across as gatekeeping for that reason. What I'm hoping to do in my new experiments in evaluative uh, criticism of poetry is to be very clear that the value for a reader in reading my work is to know what my specific opinion is. <laughs> now, one of the great risks there is, does anyone in this world care what Erica McAlpine thinks about poems, which ones she thinks are better or worse? Um, and I think it's a great risk for me. If nobody cares what my opinion is, then they shouldn't read my evaluative criticism. But as I'm thinking about the kinds of work I want to put out there as a critic, I feel, um, I feel like my best shot is to be myself, read a poem, say what I think is good about it, and if it's moving to a reader, knowing the position I'm coming from, what my worldview is, um, then that's great. But I certainly wouldn't be closing or opening any gates uh, based on, on my opinions. So we've got a question at the back there from James, one from Tommy. Do we have any others in the YouTube chat? Okay, so I think if we finish with those two questions, um, that will draw us to a close. So, James. No, it's great, uh, thank you. Give me lots to think about. Um, I guess just uh, one, just very quick observation about the um, uh, the Heck poem. That that's uh, it, to me, it, it seems very much to have the cadences of stand-up comedy, and you know, be, beginning with uh, there was this girl, which is yeah. sort of classy. I mean, that, there's something odd about the this, isn't there? That uh, this is normally for something like within reach, like the bottle of perfume. But if you put it in the past tense, it becomes 
just this guy, this this uh, this person, the subject of a joke. And uh, but I, I guess the, the question. I mean, I, I think stand-up comedy is is a good is maybe a good thing to think about in relation to evaluative criticism because that kind of other jokes land or they don't. And and I and I was I was just thinking about your talk and I was I was wondering whether the the very sense of of a kind of a, a an audience for poetry uh, that could be uh, that evaluative criticism could could make an appeal to in universal terms. I mean, is that is that the equivalent of the you, you know the the tide going out in religious faith here in in this lecture? And is it, is it is the difficulty now of of making any judgment that everybody could be assumed to agree with now uh, difficult? And I think it's also a question that. That affects stand-up comedy, I think, as well. Like, you know, I mean, it, 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 you, you hear stand-up com comics from the '60s, and they they are no longer funny. And you, no. you, you that that kind of implicit sense that an audience can go with a with a speaker, if that ever existed, it certainly doesn't exist now. But yeah, that, that was just my thought. Yeah. That's a great thought. I think I totally agree with it. Um, <laughs> I did stand-up comedy when I was young, actually. And I wasn't great at it, so I hope that's not a, <laughs> hope that's not a bad omen. Also, when it goes wrong, it goes really, really wrong, it doesn't does. it? <laughs> it does, but you know, on the other hand, a great stand-up comic, comic is um, incredibly entertaining. And I will say, I'm glad you brought up comedy, because one of the things I want for my own critical writing um, is for it to have some kind of entertainment value that feels akin to the ways that I like to entertain when I speak to people who I know. I like to be a jokester. I like to make people laugh. Um, and you know, there are some critics who are basically philosophers. And there are others who are theologians. If I were the stand-up comic of the literary critical world, I think I could <laughs> do worse, um, as long as the jokes didn't fall fully flat all the time. Okay, we've got time for one last question over there. Thank you. Um, the, the mention of um, the bad translation of Sophocles made me think about translation theory yeah. as something that people brought in here. In other words, a good translation attains, uh, according to Nabokov, attempts to achieve an equivalent deviation from its source material. Yes. Um, and I'm thinking of the equivalent deviation that Heck's trying to achieve yeah. from the culture around him to the one that Arnold is trying to achieve. I mean, if both of the poems are about, say, the fear of disillusionment, mm -hmm. What do you do with your material? So I suppose my question is really about two ways of evaluating a poem which is in a parodic uh, or imitative relationship with the previous poem. Because on the one hand, you could take the Christopher Ricks line where you know he measures every poem against life full stop <laughs> and <laughs> doesn't yeah. want to attend to the cultural historical circumstances of the poem. And the other is where you know one of the qualities of hex poem and also possibly its limitation um, is that, you know, it recognizes that um, it doesn't have the equivalent pathos that Arnold's poem is able to draw upon, namely the, the real pathos of the withdrawal of the sea of faith at that time. Rather, it has to achieve its effects about the sphere of disillusionment within just kind of, you know, quite a sort of tawdry cynicism of its moment. Um, so I guess that's mainly a point, but it's also a question about two ways of evaluating a poem like Hecht's. One in terms of, you know, the heuristic quality in which it measures the historical distance, and yes, the other is absolutely... which is not how Arnold himself evaluated. I mean, Arnold was thinking of superior <laughs> and inferior. Hecht, I do think, is thinking more relationally. Um, he may well have been very proud of the way he achieved his moments Arnoldian sense, you know, that he brought that poem a hundred years forward and um, created something roughly equivalent. Uh, I like that very much. Um, and, you know, this is a question that comes up in the other chapters I'm writing. One chapter is on translation, a translation of a Petrarch poem by Wyatt and by Surrey. That has one, that brings up one set of problems. Um, but you know, not all comparisons have that element. 
I'm probably going to do another chapter on an early poem by a poet and then that poet's own revision of, you know, and well, maybe actually, maybe, maybe the years, the intervening year difference between those two examples would, would still stick. So I think all I can say is, yes, one has to be very careful in thinking through the relation between the two poems when one comes up with how to evaluate what success means. Um, and I think, I think perhaps my allowing Arnold to win, you're seeing there uh, the part of me that is kind of fundamentally Arnoldian, who likes to think in terms of superior and inferior rather than um, a little bit more contextually. So yeah, thank you for that question. Thank you. And um, that's, I've been, it's been a wonderful um, evening. Um, we've run out of time, sadly. But um, poetry and uh, criticism um, and talking about poetry, and uh, I like to think, is all very thirsty work. Um, so uh, please uh, say, join me in uh, thanking Erica McAlpine for a wonderful lecture today, and we can continue our conversations out in the reception uh, over a few drinks. Thank you. Thank you.